Okay, so today's topic is data and copyright, which with the subtitle is complicated. Uh, this is a topic I've been working to understand for a number of years. I can't claim to be an expert, but I can claim to have a decent understanding of both the law and also why it exists in its current form. And so today is an overview of current law and court decisions. It is not legal advice or replacement for legal advice. And it is not unfortunately a thing with easy answers. And I'm sorry for that, but that is how copyright law works. And you'll understand why shortly. So the case that has the most application to data and copyright is Feist Publications versus Rural Telephone Company. And this was uh, decided by the Supreme Court in 1991. It is about phone books, which are in a way a database. And so the story is that Rural Telephone create a phone book directory by painstakingly verifying phone, number, phone numbers and addresses by going door to door. Uh, Feist wanted to reuse this information in their own publications and asked Rule for a license. Rule refused to grant them the license, so Feist just decided to steal the data. And Rule was able to verify that they stole it because they included fake numbers that Rule inserted to like detect if someone had taken their stuff. And so Rule sued and claimed copyright infringement. So the basics of this case are pretty straightforward. Someone published a directory. Someone took that information and republished it without permission. Lawsuit ensued. The core question with this is, can rural telephone claim copyright on the information in the book, which is names, numbers, and addresses? And the answer is no, but the really interesting part is why not? And it's because the things in the phone book that rural compiled are facts, and facts by law cannot be copyrighted. So, this is a quote from the decision, which is original as the term is used in copyright it means only that the work was independently created by the author, as opposed to copied from other works, and that it possesses at least minimal degree of creativity. And that last part, minimal degree of creativity is really important and where the really fine line for can data be copyrighted comes down on and it is a hard one. So for copyright, you have to have originality, which really means creativity. And you can only claim it if there is creativity. So it's facts are by nature not creative. And facts do not owe origin to an act of authorship. They just exist. Data is factual information and thus not creative. So it sounds pretty clear that you can't copyright data. However, there's more. So the requisite level of creativity is extremely low to apply for copyright. Even a slight amount will suffice. The vast majority of works make this grade quite easily. Vast majority, once again, being key here. This protection is a subject to an important limitation. The mere fact that a work is copyrighted does not mean that every element of the work can be protected. Others may copy the underlying facts, but not the precise words used to present them. So most works, including data, can show low levels of creativity. However, the data itself cannot be copyrighted. And so this means the copyright in a factual contemplation, aka a data set, is extremely thin. So this is a little dense, so just, uh, so vast majority of works so most things. However, the data themselves cannot be copyrighted. Very thin protection. So 
So what can be copyrighted in a data set? It basically comes down to the arrangements, selection, and compilation of facts. And so how the facts and data were included. So what you're choosing to put in, what you're choosing to leave out, how you're ordering them, how you're labeling them, how you're displaying them are all things that can have copyright applied to them. However, routine, typical, and quote unquote, garden variety arrangements are not creative. So the ways we normally order data, alphabetical, largest to smallest, things like that, that's not eligible for copyright. So then we get into the, well, what about my data? So the quote unquote data set may be protected, but not the data it contains. And this is the part that's really hard is that time, effort, and cost, uh, also known as the sweat of the brow argument, are not measures of originality or creativity, which means they don't count towards whether or not something gets protected by copyright. And so I just have an open question of, does this feel fair? Because data can be extremely hard to make, verify, collect, and prepare, much less um, actually use. To many, this feels unfair. However, this was a really important quote I found in reading the decision, which is, points out that the point of copyright is to promote prog the progress of science and the useful arts, not to reward the labor of authors. This sounds very counterintuitive to what most of us have learned about copyright and how it's applied in modern day. However, it does have specific limitations because it is there to keep things, some things out of copyright and other intellectual property rights can apply such as patents and trademarks. And so this is, I think, where the final verdict on what can and cannot be copyrighted on data comes down to, which is only parts of it can be copyrighted. It's a very thin protection and it's because facts exist to promote progress. That's my own interpretation of all of this once I put it together. So now we're going to do a practice exercise and I'm going to present you two different ca data cases and we'll go through whether or not you think copyright applies. Um, I will say I'm here to kind of guide this discussion. I don't have a verdict that is legal because once again, I'm not a lawyer and only courts can decide whether or not copyright applies to something. So let's look at the first one. This is a very basic data set in a spreadsheet. It was collected by placing cameras on poles in three different habitats. The cameras are automated and they were set to take photos every five seconds between sunset and sunrise. And then the number of insects in each photo was counted by hand and then combined with local weather data. Does this data set show originality, creativity, and is there, does this apply to their selection and arrangement? This is open discussion time, so please feel free to unmute yourselves or uh, enter or put comments in the chat. There are no wrong or right answers here. Is this, okay, so question, Megan, would this be what you call a data set and therefore is it protected? Ah, uh, okay, so an individual piece of this data set, for example, the date is a fact. The date cannot be copyrighted. That by itself is a fact multiple facts together create a data set. So remember the information in the data set cannot be protected, but the way it's presented can be. And so, and this is very tricky. So this is why I wanted to open it up for questions and discussion. So if, oops, let me go back. 
So if I look at this data set, we have some very basic uh, categories, date, year, time, habitat, temp, humidity, wind, number of insects. And all of these just contain numbers or a code that is a stand-in for a place in some cases and a specific transect along in the habitat. All of these are facts. Um, you can't copyright a date. Like you can't prevent other people from using dates. You can't prevent other people from using temperature, humidity, and wind conditions. The way this whole thing is compiled is potentially eligible for copyright protection. Does that make a bit more sense? And this is really tricky. It has taken me a number of years to get comfortable with this idea. All right, I got a thumbs up from one person. <laughs> Two thumbs up, excellent. All right, now I'm at three, awesome. So again, what is not protected, the pieces within the data set, what is potentially protected, the entire arrangement of the data, including the words you're using to describe the fields, uh, how you coded things, stuff like that. Follow-up questions. So in this presentation of data, it is, it is copyright, but if I choose to convert this into a different format, Yes, this is where things get tricky. So yes, um, for example, I was able to download this. I opened it to another program. Um, so already it's kind of probably not exactly the same as it was originally sent out, right? Uh, and I can do things with it because facts aren't copyrightable and I'm just manipulating facts. What I couldn't do probably is republish it and claim original authorship because that would be a violation of the original data sets copyright for me to claim it's a new object. Something else you can do with this is I could create a whole new set of graphs and pictures and the original authors of the data set could not claim copyright on my new pieces of work I did based on their facts. All right, let's go to example number two. So this is a 3D video. It's very short and simple. I'm gonna load it up. Can you guys see it on my screen? Okay, if you can't see the video, let me know. Robin, I will get to your question shortly. This is the extent of the data set at this moment. Uh, so it's very simple. It shows the interactions of three different pieces on a cube surface. So uh, is there originality, creativity in this? The selection and arrangement apply? Oh, don't worry about the is it an image part. That was something I meant to take out. We'll get to that later. Again, you can unmute yourself if you wish, um, or you can put questions in chat. Robin and Charles, I see your questions and I will get to it. Because I think we're gonna have to go back to the spreadsheet for this. So when I look at this, what I see is a representation of a model that was based on facts, probably in spreadsheets. Uh, some of the originality and creativity that were applied here was someone had to choose these colors. It's a very small thing, but again, the requirement is minimal. So that might cover it, I don't know. Um, selection and arrangement. I, get, I don't know if the, I am not an expert in this uh, kind of science. I don't know if the cube shape is meaningful or not. That technically might have been important. 
but these are the kinds of questions we have to look at with data. Uh, okay, let's go back to the spreadsheet to do these follow-up questions. Go back. Okay. So Robin asks, this ability to reformat data is what allows review articles to pull together from previously published articles, right? Yes, though also in that case, it's also often covered by uh, fair use because they're only using a portion of a previous publication in the new article. So yeah, but usually it's both the ability to reformat data coupled with fair use that lets review articles and um, meta-analyses do that. Uh, Charles had a question. So how does it differ from the rural case that you started with? Because the directory also employed some minimal creativity in terms of how the information was arranged. Ah, so the court says <laughs> that because the directory was alphabetical, there is no creativity <laughs> because that's a very basic way to organize information. So if they had done something else, like maybe it was by theme, which would be an unusable phone book, but that might have been copyrightable, but because it was alphabetical, and that's kind of an automated process, especially now of computers, it's not creative. <laughs> and so in this case, the um, actual order, which is by date, is not creative in this case on this spreadsheet at all. Um, it might be some of the other things. <laughs> Comment that copyright really freaks me out. Yes, it's uh, very complicated. You're not alone. Um, and then Robin had a comment about the 3D data set that someone had to write the computer program to do this. And in this case, it's actually more complicated because this is data was fed into a program that then rendered this. And so there's two separate things. There's the software that made it, and there's the data that was fed into the software to make it. Software is under copyright. However, once again, that data is not, and the outputs of software aren't necessarily under copyright because those require, those have creativity, can have different copyright protections based on the author. In other words, they're a tool just because just the same way a pen is a tool. Um, so they're not, the person who made the software isn't necessarily an author. Sorry, this is where things get really complicated with copyright. Okay. Does anyone feel comfortable enough to share an example of their data for us to discuss and talk about. If not, that's fine. I can pull other ones or we can go on to the next part of the presentation. Once again, you may unmute yourselves or put it in chat. Uh, just a, a comment. Uh, I am from, uh, from France and as the uh, the copyright uh, law is very different. Uh, it's it's uh, protected by uh, how, how I can say that. You have database protections in France. Yes, uh, but it's uh, it's totally different. It's um, uh, I, I'm taking the the, the, the the example of photo. Uh, it's uh, simply the ID uh, behind simply the uh, the action to uh, to have uh, an int uh, an intellectual fact mm -hmm. is already uh, part of copyright. So the the term copyright by itself is not uh, is not meaningful in, in this case. But I will just um, uh, raise your attention that uh, the. the um, the, the law can be very different concern uh, the country uh, you are looking at. Yes, so US copyright is very different from international copyright um, for good or for worse. And so today's presentation really only covers US copyright because um, other countries, France, Germany, UK, and 
believe some of the Commonwealth countries as well, also have specific database copyright, which is very different and hard to put in the con put in the context of you how US copyright works because it is so different. Okay, Lily, I'm going to open up. Oh wait, Joshua has a data set I can link to. I'm gonna to go to that one because let's see if we can use it. All right, so Joshua has CSV format, so spreadsheets. Is there a specific file we should look at, Joshua? Um, hi. Um, well, it depends on what you might want to do. If you're going to look at the, the data, the, the spreadsheet, or the CSV file, the, C the XLS file code, I, I guess there's a comma delimited file and okay. uh, it, it, and uh, this one, you know, I mean, so, so it's kind of a mess, but. <laughs> Let me see if I can get it to open in Excel. Yeah. Um, so because I'm recording, oh, this is fun. I can't minimize Zoom. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, which I didn't know until I tried today. No, I don't want to save it as a bookmark. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. So, um, let's see. And you can look at the code book if you code want to see Code book will work. That'll, okay, there yeah. we go. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what's there anyhow. <laughs> yeah, which I mean, code books are also data. So, um, all right, can everyone see this code book? Uh, okay, yes, awesome. So thumbs up. Thank you for that. And so this code book explains the fields in the data set, which was that kind of messy CSV file we viewed for a second. Um, and so I'm pretty familiar with code books. So I'm, this is the question number. This is what the question prompt was, the page of the survey, the type of the question, the data type, the value. I would have to, ah, I see what the value is. So current career field, 99 is for the default. So if they didn't answer it, the answer would be 99. This was assigned the number one, assigned the number two, and so on. So yeah, so this is very similar to that insect data sheet in that um, it's, a comp it's a whole bunch of facts, right? However, there is a key difference in this one, I would say, which is this is directly related to something that I believe you can copyright, which is a survey. <laughs> And so there is probably some selection and arrangement that went into the survey because those are intentionally designed. I personally do not know if that would carry over to the data set with how these are also numbered or if that's also considered, what was it garden variety uh, order? I'm not sure. And this is where things with copyright get really, confusing and complicated, which is why this presentation was subtitled, It's Complicated. Joshua, do you have anything you want to add about this? Uh, no, I, I mean, and we didn't, we did not proceed to seek any kind of protection. In fact, this is deposited with ICPSR as well as being available on the, uh, on the university, in the university repository at the University of Kansas, so. Excellent. Did you apply a license to it? Um, I, you know, I'd have, I, I think there might be a generic license that goes the KU Scholar Works. Um, so it's at, well, I'd, 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 the bottom there, it says it is protected by copyright. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah, it does. Yeah, so, <laughs> which, which is a pretty generic statement. Which, you know, well, whatever rights we might have had. That's might, funny. Uh, well, I'll just say as authors, you can always yeah. change this. <laughs> <laughs> right. However, you can't like change existing copies. And so with digital things, it gets very complicated. <laughs> but as authors, you can change the rights things are issued under. Yeah. 
Um, Lily, let me see if I can open your file. Oh, that one works. Okay. Ooh, okay. So this one is text, not numbers. And so this actually adds is maybe easier to apply copyright to because part of the law, the part of the Supreme Court decision did say that the words used to describe a thing were part of the originality. Okay, a comment from Lily. They would be facts from other literature. Oh, were these pulled from other things? So yeah, if it's reused, that may not, then the author didn't make it, but the author put them together. So yeah, I see it gets really complicated, huh? So if this was completely original work, something not pulled from existing research, probably better eligible for copyright production. If it's standardized words, and pulled from other literature and existing bodies of work, probably not as much copyright protection. Does that make sense? I did say there were going to be no easy answers today. So this is why. Okay, so let's go back. So thank you for sharing your stuff. Um, I also have a bunch of stuff, but it's not necessarily the easiest to understand. So I didn't want to pull out my own stuff because I knew you guys would have better examples. So, okay. So <laughs> this is where we get into some really fun theoretical stuff. So I had that, is it an image prompt for the 3D rendering? Um, because copyright defines images as two-dimensional and three-dimensional works of fine graphic and applied art, photographs, prints, art reproductions, maps, slips, charts, diagrams, models, and technical drawings, including architectural plans. However, in this new digital world, we have things such as procedurally generated images and 3D worlds, such as the No Man's Sky video game, which has entire worlds and maps that have been created by algorithms. And we have automated Im image capture, such as in that insect data set. We have speed cameras, we have video recordings of experiments, and we have field recordings, audio and video. And these are really hard to reconcile with this in many ways. And so it is important to know that this Copyright and the idea of images was really established to protect works of art. However, <laughs> there's the whole what is art argument. I actually have an undergraduate degree in digital art and fine art and video games are sometimes are often regarded as art forms. So it's not always an easy answer. One other thought provoking thing to think about, what is an author? Under copyright law in the US, the creator of an original expression of the work is its author, and the author is also the owner of copyright, its copyright. However, animals cannot be authors. A 2016 case of a monkey named Naruto um, who stole a camera and took some excellent selfies owner of the camera and his company tried to claim copyright on the images taken by the monkey. Uh, it was rejected by the court and those images are now in the public domain. Uh, it was viewed that they cannot be copyrighted. What about things produced by algorithms, AIs, and robots? This really is to be determined. It is complicated because software is eligible for copyright protection, which we mentioned earlier. And software is a tool, so what it outputs isn't really, if it's creative and made by a human, it should be eligible for copyright protection. The software has no human interaction, it's just running and making things. Are those things eligible for copyright protection? And if so, who is the author? I don't know. <laughs> the law doesn't know. 
Um, there's a lot of literature on this right now with strong arguments that it should be placed in the public domain because it's not directly a human output and copyright was really made to protect human creative outputs. So this is something I think we're gonna see in the next few years. Uh, for example, there was a recent art exhibit in Egypt with a AI robot as the artist with works that it created. I have no, they, it's uh, not a US art project. I don't know what the copyright um, rules for that artwork is, but it's already happening. The robot probably is somehow protected under copyright and other IP protections, but it's artwork, I don't know. Okay, question. Would a graph that you make in Excel be considered a garden variety presentation of facts? Assuming you just use a default setup. Ah, uh, you mean just using like the out of the box settings for like how the title and the colors are displayed? Okay, so no, uh, because you are still choosing to apply the default template. Technically that's a creative choice. So I would say garden variety presentation of facts is not mm, based on the presets of the software. You are still making a human choice to do that. So technically that's a human creative thing. This is again, copyright gets weird. So I don't think that would be part of the decision, but it would be hard to know they would have to go to court. So, okay, so one last thing to either complicate or make it easier are licenses. So something to keep in mind is that ownership and copyright are not the same thing. You can own a thing and not own the copyright. The easiest way to explain this is a publisher may own the copyright of a book, but you can own a copy of it. Uh, so research data, for example, is usually owned by the research institution, and that is the case here at Iowa State, where the authors and creators are data stewards and data custodians, and that is not um, a downgrade in ownership because uh, <laughs> those positions have a lot of decision-making power. Uh, you get to choose the day-to-day handling and decision-making about the data, where it's published, who has access. You get a lot of decision over your data with these roles. However, it has to be owned by the research institution in most cases, because for, if it's funded research, grants and awards are given to universities and not people. And those funders have stakes, have ownership stakes in the data as well. And the university has to administer um, the research and to comply with um, legal requirements for ethical research and other things that relate to the data. So, oh, how is American copyright considered internationally and which jurisdiction is applicable? That is really hard. And I, this is where I have to say, I am not a lawyer and I don't know all the complexities about international copyright and international law. I mostly stick to the American stuff. Um, I know country of origin does apply. Um, and there are some international um, trees where copyright is mutually respected in other countries. So it would really depend. Uh, okay, I have two questions. Um, one from Rudy asking, do IRB offices allow institutions to be owners of data? Okay, so IRB offices work for the institutions and um, they don't determine ownership. They determine handling and protocols. They don't determine ownership. Your institution determines ownership. Does that make sense? Also, any contracts you sign might determine ownership as well. All right, I got, I think I have a thumbs up on that one. 
Okay, second question related to, oh, related to ownership. So if an author were to go to court for copyright infringement, would the damages be awarded to the author or the institution? <laughs> They're usually awarded to the copyright owner and not the author. So if you are not the owner, usually you don't get um, awards or you don't get damage awards. This is why if you publish a paper and you have signed your copyright over to the publisher and the publisher sues someone for infringement, the publisher gets damage awards. Authors do not. Same case for data. Does that make sense? All right, excellent. Uh, let's go, okay, so. Intellectual property, copyright, and licenses is the next thing once we have ownership kind of covered. So data licenses let owners, stewards, and custodians because uh, sometimes owners give the right to decide these things to stewards and custodians. Data licenses decide what can and cannot be done with data and often cover intellectual property rights beyond copyright. And I will admit, this is the part I don't know as well, which is things beyond copyright. But, and this is why I would suggest people go talk to our intellectual property office uh, and tech transfer office. And the licenses are primarily used to communicate to other people what can and cannot be done legally with data. And so always share with the license because it avoids um, ambiguities and uncertainties. Okay, question. Potential ownership copyright issues related to US-based scholars publishing journals owned by offshore publishers. Oh, classic, that's a hard one. Yeah, uh, do you mind if I hold that one until I finish this section? Because that's, that's gonna be more on the copyright of um, research publications than data. We will get to that one. Okay. So licenses are used to communicate what people can and cannot do with data is the big takeaway with that, which is why I asked Joshua if there was a license on his data, because I was curious what the rules uh, around it were. So uh, the last thing to know is public domain and CCBY. So Many scientific organizations and governments recommend placing research data in the public domain, which is where you claim authors claim no rights reserved and place their work in the public domain. In other words, they have waived all rights to their data. The reason for this is to keep licenses and uncertainty from unnecessarily limiting data's potential because as we've learned earlier today, Data and copyright is complicated and hard to understand. Charles asks, is signing away your copyright tantamount to signing away your intellectual property right? Yes, if you put something in the public domain, you can exercise no ownership rights over it. However, this is where things get interesting. The right to attribution to say that you are the author of something especially in scholarly and scientific work. That is something that is a standard of the industry. It has nothing to do with legality and copyright. You are ethically required by your journals and your, um, usually your institution to tell people where you got your stuff from. It has nothing to do with what the license is. So that's another layer. So placing something in the public domain may have very little, if any, impact on whether or not you get cited and how your stuff is reused. Okay, Last, so Creative Commons attribution is the next best thing to public domain because the only thing it requires is attribution. So this is kind of the middle ground because it this uh, is very easy to do in most cases works with academic and scholarly um, norms, and also gives very liberal use to data. Okay, we now have 
two questions related to, I believe, journal publications, because now we've gotten into the whole fun, bigger copyright. And Robin is on our call. Robin, do you want to answer these questions? I'm happy to help you answer these questions <laughs> because, as usual, it all depends. Uh -huh. So what's the first one here? I got to scroll back up. Okay, the first yeah. one is, could you comment on potential ownership and copyright issues related to U.S.-based scholars publishing journals owned by offshore publishers? And so my comment with that is, uh, the contract you sign with the publisher, no matter what country they're in, will determine ownership and copyright, regardless of what country you and the publisher are in. Does that sound right, Robin? Yes, absolutely. Okay. You know, y y again, it goes back to that lovely picture of the, the person with the, the opera glasses. If oh, yeah. Nobody reads their author. Uh, their copyright transfer agreement or whatever that submission system calls it. It's a click through nowadays, but if you click through, you've agreed to everything in it and it's going to lay out what jurisdiction and everything like that. And with these offshore publishers, so many of them do have main North American offices, even if their headquarters is in the Netherlands or something. So who knows where, what jurisdiction they're going to choose, but it goes back to still the copyright won't apply to the underlying data. It, mm -hmm. it will apply to how you present the data probably. And then of course your words. Yes, and there's a whole separate discussion we could have about academic figures, charts and tables and how those <laughs> contain data and how you can't really copyright protect most of them, but co publishers claim copyright protection and wanna charge you for reusing them. That's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, second question. <laughs> um, because we are getting close to time. Mm. Um, if I create a framework but have published it in a journal, therefore sign my copyright away, do people want to use my framework, need to ask me, or do they need to ask the journal for permission to use it in their publication? Uh, Again, really it yeah. I was cool. going to say, Lily, can you also uh, provide more information on uh, what the framework would entail? Yeah, Megan. So this is this is kind of like I, I would categorize that as a figure. And so I created it. It's original. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I know that I can copyright the idea and the, the content within it. However, because I published it in a journal, now, if in the future somebody wants to use that uh, that framework in your manuscript or have been accepted, who who gives the permission to include that complete image in their manuscript? I I want to bring up one point, Lily. You can't copyright an idea. Mm -hmm. You can only copyright something set in tangible form. So yeah, by that I, I meant the framework. The, yeah. the framework, the presentation of that, and the, the, the framework itself, not the idea, so, but the framework itself. This is where, and we didn't cover this as much because data is digital and thus very intangible. <laughs> and so I didn't want to rely on that too much today. Uh, but I think this relies on if they want to use your exact figure that you publish, then yes, they're probably going to have to ask the publisher or whoever owns the copyright. If you did not, if you retained the copyright, say you published with a PLOS journal or an open access journal where the author retains the copyrights through CC, you would be the copyright owner. If you publish with an Elsevier subscription journal and you sign a copyright transfer agreement, transferring the copyright to them, then someone wanting to reuse your image would get have to contact the journal. Thank you. Okay. So I've been getting a lot of emails asking for permission and, you know, I've always said yes, but I'm thinking now they should be asking the journal because I did sign it to a subscription journal. But then again, you also have to consider one figure out of a whole article, unless that figure is the whole heart of the article, it could be fair use and all they might have to do is attribute it and they don't need to ask either you or the journal, but it depends. 
All right. We, I'm going to put a link to this guide that um, Abby, our elder, which I think many of you know, and if you don't, you should, who's our open access and librarian, um, has written some very basic author rights for publishing and copyright. And this doesn't cover the data. This is really about academic scholarly, excuse me, publishing. So publishing your words. Um, I've thought about creating a similar guide for data. I'm not sure how helpful it would be because as you saw today, there would be a lot of it depends as answers, <laughs> which is why I thought it would be better to do this as a talk. Um, so we could discuss how complex it is. Uh, but this is a really useful um, guide. So uh, two follow-up questions before we, uh, before I forget to do them, was asked is CCBY, which um, I showed in my presentation, I keep losing full screen on it. Creative Commons attribution, CCBY, is this compare, compatible with the FAIR data principles, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable? And the answer is yes. Creative Commons Zero and CCBY are the two licenses that are the most compatible with FAIR. This is also why these are the two licenses we support at Iowa State for licensing data. And then a follow-up question from Lily. Um, Megan, did you say that words and terms are facts and therefore not copyrighted? No. Um, how do I explain this? So words cannot be copyrighted. Um, the way you label things in data might be eligible for data copyright. And this is where, th again, this is because the whole can data be copyrighted and what is eligible is very confusing, but the way you describe something in a data set, so often words or sometimes numbers or colors, that might be part of what makes a data set copyrightable, but words and terms by themselves are not copyrightable. And I hope that makes sense because this is a very abstract thing to talk about. All right, we have seven minutes left. We have time, I think, for two or three more questions. And we have gone through a lot today. So um, take a couple seconds to think about things and Robin and I will be here to help answer questions. While you're thinking, I do want to thank the people that helped make this talk today possible. Sarah Benson, the copyright librarian at the University of Illinois, gave a really great presentation last month, which um, I shamelessly pulled from, especially with the um, telephone book case. For how to explain this concept, um, my coworker Katie made those awesome memes. You guys participated today in what is not a easy thing to talk about. And then the slide template came from Slides Carnival, which is a pretty amazing resource. So uh, I did put the link to that um, author rights guide in the chat. We have other guides from the Iowa State University Library that cover different aspects of copyright, such as copyright and teaching and then the classroom um, and stuff like that too. Ooh, we, Robin has a question. Do funders ever ask for control slash copyright of data generated by the research they fund? They, so yes and no. Um, United States government funders might if it contains controlled or sensitive information. Uh, so if it's classified information, yes. Um, for the most part, what they do instead is dictate that the data has to be open. That's the thing that affects most data sets uh, that are federally funded. 
other ways funders impact uh, data control and copyright is that if you have a contract with a private funder, they data rights and data um, licensing may be included in the contract and it may prevent you from sharing um, secondary data based off the data set they provide or the data may all have to go back to the funder at the end of the contract. So make sure to read those things very carefully. And the IRB is really in the middle of all that to make sure things are ethical. Uh, so they don't usually control where things go. They just make sure it's done safely and ethically. All right. Well, I think that's all for today. If you have follow-up questions, please reach out. Again, I am not a lawyer, but I will do my best to provide examples and resources. Uh, and I could encourage you to keep working on this concept because I think it's going to start changing uh, in the future too, but we'll see. Because data has become more and more valuable in the last decade, couple of decades, especially as we move into big data analytics and social media analytics. So thank you everyone and have a wonderful day.